Hello and welcome to your Asian Pulse TV, an informative and resourceful station. I'm your host Manbir Randhawa and today we are broadcasting from the unceded territories of Silver Tooth Nation, Mokim and Kwantlen Nations. We feel very blessed for the generosity of the First Nation people who allow us to share this traditional land with them. In today's episode, we'll be talking about two extra crucial problems of the modern world. One is saving our earth and two, saving our children. This year, Earth Day falls on April 22nd. And did you ever wonder how Earth Day began? The first Earth Day was held on April 22nd, 1970 when San Francisco activist John McConnell and Wisconsin-based Senator Galen Nelson separately asked Americans to join in a grassroots demonstration. Dealing with dangerously serious issues concerning toxic drinking water, air pollution, and effects of pesticides, an impressive 20 million which is about 10% of the population, ventured outside and protested together. Moving further, U.S. President Richard Nixon led the nation in creating the Environmental Protection Agency, which followed with successful laws, including the AIR Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Endangered Species Act. Isn't it revolutionary? So, what are you doing this Earth Day? It is our duty to act in some way and act every day, even if it is little by little. So maybe plant a tree, conserve some water, or reduce, reuse, and recycle. You will be contributing towards Earth. Next is the 420. Even though April 20th, which is also called 420, is a day for the celebration and awareness about marijuana, we would like to highlight the wrong notions that youngsters have towards smoking or using marijuana as a recreational drug. There is no doubt that marijuana affects brain development. When people begin using marijuana as teenagers, the drug may impair thinking, memory, and learning functions. A study has been conducted in New Zealand, in part by researchers of Duke University, showed that people who started smoking marijuana heavily in their teens and had an ongoing marijuana use disorder, they have lost an average of eight IQ points. Now that's a lot of it. And that too at a young age when your brain is developing and growing and you are building your cognitive Uh, processes. So we request the teenagers to please smoke carefully. In fact, don't smoke when you are a teenager because the lost mental abilities didn't fully return in those who quit marijuana as adults. Further, the effects, the side effects of smoking marijuana includes that cannabis smoke contains a mixture of chemicals that can irritate your lungs and bronchial passages. It's similar to tobacco smoke, so it increases the risk of bronchitis. Using cannabis during pregnancy can affect the developing baby. The child may have trouble with memory, concentration, and problem-solving skills. THC present in marijuana alters the way you process information, so your judgment is impaired. THC also changes the way a part of your brain called hippocampus processes information. So it affects your ability to form new memories. Did you see the connection? Why there are so many mental health issues arising with our younger generation? Think about it. But for now, let's take a short break and hear some words from our sponsors. I understand how important it is to have a place called home, and it's frustrating using your hard-earned money on rent. Vic Prasad can make you a homeowner. Get pre-approved services provided to first-time buyers and new immigrants. You can qualify for mortgage even if you have bad credit. 
Call Vic Prasad now on 604-306-6647. Vic Prasad is associated with Kraft Mortgages Canada Incorporated. For any kind of visa-related services, contact Milky Way Immigration, a galaxy of opportunities located at Unit 209-9547-152 Street, Surrey, BC. They have licensed immigration consultants, placement officers, and LMIA experts to meet your immigration and recruitment needs. Book one-time free consultation either on Facebook or by calling 604-396-0005. Bollywood Banquet Hall and Conference Center located at Pile Business Center at 201-8166-128 Street in Surrey. No celebration is too small to accommodate you. They have newly renovated two halls to serve you, up to 1,000 guest capacity, top-notch chefs to delight you with delectable and heavenly cuisine. So just call Bollywood Banquet Hall at 604-598-2700 for your events. Benisi Mobile Detailing Services. They offer commercial trucks, cars, SUV, boats, bikes, RVs, and much more. Just give them a call at 778-808-2859. Just give them a call at 778-808-2859 and they will do all kind of services at your home. Welcome to Asian Pulse. As we all know, I have a special guest in the studio today and I'm pretty sure that you all want to hear from this gentleman that I invited and he said yes. <laughs> and he's no other than oh, yeah. the chief of the police for Metro Vancouver Transit Police. As you might have heard in the news recently, do you feel safe to be on the public transport uh, transportation, whether it's buses or sky train? If you feel safe, or for me personally speaking, I feel safe. I think sometimes we all need to feel safe. We have to show confidence in ourselves when you're taking transportation, public transportation, that even people that are thinking of doing something, they stay away. That's how I walk around with uh, my big head on my head, and I feel safe. But we can ask the chief, are you feeling safe? And is there too many happen in last couple of months, maybe we shall say? So welcome, Say Thank you for being able to take the time and uh, want to answer the difficult questions. So the first thing first, I'm going to ask you, talk about your policing background. Well, first of all, thanks <laughs> for inviting me, right? It's always a pleasure to come out and uh, speak to individuals such as yourself and to reach out to the public here. Um, so my policing background, I'm in my 37th year of policing. I started actually as a volunteer reserve officer, if you go even back further. And then the majority of my career was with the New Westminster Police, mm -hmm. where I came up through the ranks in the New Westminster, and I obtained the rank of Chief Constable with New West. Um, I spent eight years in that position with the New Westminster Police, and then I, in 2019, I took the job, I was going to retire, then I took the job opportunity with the Transit Police. But as part of my career, I've also experienced uh, you know, issues across the country. I've been a member of the Canadian Chiefs of Police and on their executive board. I've been with the Organized Crime Agency of BC on their board. Uh, so there's a lot of experience both locally, uh, provincially, and nationally. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a little bit about what is happening, because for last two, three years since 2019, uh, we were under lockdown and a lot of people were working from home and they weren't taking the public transportation, either as buses or sky train to get to and from work. And recently, and your numbers were going down. Right. But now is the time in 2023 that people are back to work and numbers were going up, and you want to reach those numbers to whatever 19, I mean 2018 and 19 right. used to be. So how difficult, it's a very challenging job where they put you as the chief, so how difficult it is for you to increase the numbers in both SkyTrain and buses? Yeah, so you're exactly right. Like we saw a, a significant decrease when COVID hit us. And it ridership was probably half or less than half of what it what it normally was. Um, on a given day prior to COVID, 
you could have over 500,000 people use the systems. And which meant if they each took two journeys, there was like over a million journeys a day. Mm -hmm. Now we're back over 400,000 people a day using the systems and about over 800,000 journeys a day. And so when we went into COVID, we had to change the way we did things. There was a lot of fear of people getting into crowded places, as you may remember. There was masking and cleaning. And generally, people started to have this aversion to being in crowded spaces. And I think some of that still lingers today. So as the system returns and people return to it, we're getting some tensions as, as things get full again. Also, but what we've seen over the last few years is an increase in mental health issues. And I'm not just talking about what we might think are the more obvious ones of individuals who seem to be pretty visible, uh, whether it be homeless addictions or, or behaviors that are concerning to us. But I think there's a lot of stress into everybody in terms of their daily routines, their daily jobs. And you know whether it be a student, whether it be someone returning to work who's worked from home for two or three years, there's a lot more tension, there's a lot more potentially mental health issues that are going. It hasn't translated into a rise in crime. Our crime rates are actually still pretty steady. And what I mean by that is we do some comparisons to ridership. Mm -hmm. So how many riders, uh, you know, how many hundred thousand riders and what are our crime rates? So our raw numbers have come up a little bit, Mm -hmm. but our numbers per hundred thousand ridership have remained pretty steady, Mm -hmm. indicating to us it's been pretty safe. And then recently when you have this aberration of, you know, a series of serious incidents, which, um, you know, which does shake everybody and raise concerns, the, the thing we have to look at is what are the people's perceptions now? How are they perceiving the system to be? And is the perception the reality of what we need to address? So talking about the safety then, at any point or in future, are you planning to put security people or translate police officers on the buses and the sky train, like what happens in New York and bigger cities? Do you think you may come to the place that uh, people might feel much safer? And also, I also see that, and this is with the bus drivers, they also have the union and now they have the shield on the buses. They are not going to intervene or interfere. Even if they can see in the mirror there is something happening in the back, but they would not stop the bus and just say, hold on guys, you better stop that or get off or I'm not moving. So they have not been. So have you been talking to their union? Because you cannot put every police officer or security person in each and every buses. Absolutely, and you 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 hit it you hit it right there. Like people sometimes think about that, even in crimes in their community. There's the idea of a police officer in every corner, and whether you can afford it, and whether it's even viable to to make that happen. So just to give everyone perspective, that there's over 145 kilometers of SkyTrain line. Mm-hmm. There's the C bus. There's the West Coast Express. And there's 11, up to 1,100 bus routes a day. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the geographic area that, that the transit police covers is about 1,800 square kilometers. Yeah. So the key thing here is we're not, we're not going to be able to. Now, should we step it up? Yes, we should, right? And we look at um, where are the areas that we need to be, right, when it comes to patrols? What are the, either the busy places? What are the areas that we see that are more challenging, perhaps? So whether it be the given area or whether, whether it be targeting an area or targeting an individual who's causing problems on the system, mm-hmm. we really need to look at our data and we need to make sure that we call it intelligence-led, right? Being led by the stats and the data so that we're able to you know, get out there and prevent things from happening and provide that reassurance. Mm-hmm. With that, you've heard talk, we're coming out with a community safety officer yeah. program. Mm-hmm. And this is important because we see it as part of the evolution of policing. So they, they are almost like we call it a tiered policing model. Mm-hmm. So they'll be trained, uh, they'll have skill sets, and they will provide those additional resources, if you want to call it for the lower level, more minor instances that draw concern to us, help us with community events, help us with information, and also provide additional eyes and ears onto the system, making the deployment of police officers more efficient and more effective, including cost effective um, in that respect. We also look at this, and I think we have to educate the people, and you you raise it, and I I can't speak to the bus drivers other than to say, we do get calls from bus drivers about things that, that are coming in, and it's been fairly consistent. 
And I think TransLink sees itself at time, at, well, it sees itself as there are all these eyes and ears on mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. um, you may have heard me say recently, I like to say when you're on transit, you're never alone. Yes. Because even if you're sitting at a bus stop somewhere, you can text a number we have, and we, this is unique, we live monitor our texting. So you can be speaking to an individual person while you're there. And of course, then when you get on a bus, there's a bus driver, SkyTrain, there could be a station attendant, there could be maintenance workers, there could be transit security, and of course, other passengers, and mm -hmm. never forget the police that are around as well. Yeah. There's also technologies that can be used, right? There are, there are uh, monitoring so systems. So this 877777, now yes. I got it. Right. And I have got this for a while. <laughs> Don't be a silent bystander. If there is, you know there is something happening in yeah. the back and you are in the front, there is numbers there. Yes. So just text the number. You, nobody will know who you are texting. With. That, that's correct. And, and the big thing we say to people is some people might be nervous about making a phone call and, yes, put it, yes. and being seen to make that phone call, putting it to their ear. But I would say to people, when you're on transit, take a look around. Most of the people sitting are on their phones. And that's so who they're talking to or what they're doing yeah. is there. And you won't be asked to, you know, you can, we can, you can keep your information yeah. anonymous on it. And as you said... The big thing about it is, look for what's happening to other people. Yes. We've actually been quite successful over the years where people report a lot more um, when women are being harassed. Yes. We've seen yeah. a lot more reporting in that sense, yeah. but we need it to go to the point where I almost say to somebody, if you think the police should intervene to help somebody, because remember, we're not just, and maybe help the individual who's causing some concerns. Maybe they're Maybe they appear to be passed out and you want us to check on their physical health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they appear to be needing some assistance themselves or somebody appears to be scared or being harassed. Let us know. One of the things that we also are capable in the transit system is we know where the buses are. Mm -hmm. We know where the SkyTrain's cars are. GPS works when I talk about technology. Mm -hmm. We can have them pull to the side of the road and stop. So even if it's not a transit police officer, mm -hmm. the jurisdictional police can get there as well, too. Yes. And, you know, and we work very closely with our partners in that way. That means with City RCMP, Burnaby, and New West um, yes. Police, and everywhere, uh, everyone else. Everywhere, and, and that's the interesting. You know, transit transit police go through twenty two communities. Yes. So it's it's a unique it's a unique opportunity, like, you know, for what we need to do. And I remember I have been here for a while. This transit police never used to be it's something very new, and I think it came in last ten years, maybe or twelve or fourteen. So seventeen years, so two thousand five. So okay. two thousand five, and that, and it's taken a while to kind of a, it's still a young agency I yeah. think like the new Westminster police who yes. I was with celebrated their 150th year this year right so <laughs> and, yeah. and to be 17 or 18 years old makes us you babies a baby. <laughs> we're a baby in the world right now yeah. so how many police officers do you have do you hire all the time do yes. the people leave or they stay on yeah. with you guys so like so we have 184 positions mm -hmm. and policing right now we have people who come and of course may retire or leave we do have people who transfer to us from other agencies and of course we have our own members there's a very fluid movement in mm -hmm. policing right now with a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. that comes with it and i i think what's really unique about the transit police though is this just a large scale area that we cover mm -hmm. and the idea is that we're very proactive yeah. right we can set up an initiatives and programs that will be designed to either reduce crime reduce the fear of crime and just and of course be beneficial to those we serve so your police officers are trained locally at JF? Our police officers are trained just like a police officer would be in New Westminster, or Vancouver, yeah. Delta, that. Yeah. Same at the Justice Institute of mm -hmm. BC. Mm -hmm. They are, um, instead of what we call the other police officers, municipal police officers, they're called designated a designated policing unit mm -hmm. because we don't, aren't responsible to one given city. Yeah, so you right. can move around because wherever the sky train is going, wherever right. the buses are going in Metro Vancouver, and that's why right. it's called Metro Vancouver Transit uh, Police. Absolutely. Think of wherever there's a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> bus stop. So those people that you were seeing that there are 24 of them, but 12 out of that, 12 will be hired very recently. What kind of training do they have and who can be that person? Do they carry guns? Yeah. Or yeah. 
So, so they don't carry guns. So yeah. this is part of the tiering. So they are. So who they are? Some of them will be aspiring, maybe to go into a career in policing. They are uniformed. Yes, they'll be uniformed. They'll say community safety officer on them. Their uniform will be different. It'll it'll be a lighter blue shirt. Okay. It'll say it doesn't say police on it. It says community safety officer. Um, they will have some. They will be trained in like de-escalation, mm -hmm. uh, first aid. Uh, you know, dealing with vulnerable individuals. They can also do some enforcement. They can do issue tickets. They can enforce the conduct and safety regulations, which is covers things such as you can't smoke on the trains, mm -hmm. you can't ride on top of the trains, mm -hmm. uh, things of that nature. Um, and they do have some lawful authorities, but the whole goal is if it's more serious, it goes to a police officer. But they do have tools such as a radio, handcuffs, pepper spray. They will not have a gun and they will not have a taser, right, okay. at this point. So some of the people who go into this role may be aspiring to be a police officer, yeah. so they might be a bit younger. Mm -hmm. Then again, there will be people we want to make it uh, also beneficial that if someone wants to make a career yeah. out of this, that the wages and benefits will support them in terms of having a career because we see them as being a very valuable tool and part of what the community is. And it's a new program because we had to get it endorsed by the program. Mm -hmm. We've seen it in certain places such as Vancouver and Abbotsford have versions of their community safety officer program. But we also had to design our own training program, which mm -hmm. has just been put into place. And the province has overseen that whole process with us mm -hmm. to make sure that they get the right training, the right certifications. And I also want to assure the public that because they, they have some authorities, they also fall under the oversight bodies. Mm -hmm. So they'll always be subject to review as to how, we, how, how their behaviors and interactions occur. Do you also see how beneficial that can be, or do you want to train your officers that they are not just only police officers to get another body, a mental health nurse or something? That's going to be very difficult. We don't even have enough nurses to run the hospitals. How would you pull the mental health nurses to be with on the stations, right? It will be very difficult. Do you see yourself more education and awareness being put in how to deal with if there is, you see the crime or you know something is happening, but it's more so like mental health base and these people is out or whatever is happening in there. Just to put the policing uniform out or away and be able to talk to being more passionate. With a absolutely. So policing ha agrees that the right people to sometimes deal with these matters are mental health professionals. And at the same time, we're also cognizant that there sometimes needs that policing presence, one, because of the way the Mental Health Act is written about how we can assist somebody and, and perhaps some risk or danger that we need to ensure is, is eliminated or reduced at the same time. So we really do need, and we've been doing it, looking at our police officers, how they can partner with mental health agencies, even how their uniform design is, how they're trained to approach people, how you're trained to recognize a variety of different stressors that people are, are undergoing. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing that comes afterwards is that uh, I think everyone puts the push on and everyone's recognized is, is the services after. How do you get the person? You mm -hmm. can identify a person who needs help, mm -hmm. but how do we find that help? Right. Where do we take them to? Where can they, where can they go to? Mm -hmm. And... And we hear of that concern as to, like, I can't take someone tonight mm -hmm. to somewhere where they're going to get into a treatment wow, program. Yeah. And so those are the things we all lobby for and that. Because I want to make sure we say to everybody here, being homeless or, yes. or having a mental health issue is not a crime. You know? These are, these are, these are medical issues. Yeah. They're social issues mm -hmm. that we need to help address. The police represent the public, and that becomes a very, it is probably one of the more challenging aspects today. 80% of what police officers across this country deal with are not criminal behaviors anymore. They are nuisance behaviors, they are addiction issues, they are homeless and mental health issues. And when you look at that, 20% is focused on crime activities. Mm -hmm. Our role in our societies and communities is changing. Mm -hmm. Last question I have, yeah. and maybe a lot of people that are watching you today yeah. will have for you. Yeah. Do you still feel safe to be able to take public transportation today? 
Absolutely, I do. And, the re and I don't say that for any other thing other than to say I do take it. I have grandkids, and I would trust that them to be on the system. And the reason I feel safe is I know what's going on, and I know what systems are in place there. And you always can ask for help. And if ask you see help. something happening in the buses or the SkyTrain, there is a number there. It doesn't matter. Everybody has cell phones these days. All you have to do is, and they will track it down because they have GPS. And maybe at the next stop or something, somebody will be there to help that person. Sometimes this mental illness or whatever, you are also crying for help as well. You know, I'm, yes. and, and that, that's how the behavior comes out, that you are very aggressive or you are sweating or doing, throwing things around and all that. So that's also help. That person needs help. With that, thank you so much be able to take your time out of a busy, busy schedule, be able to come and talk to our viewers, and I think a lot of people will appreciate your honesty and, uh, and, and the safety as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been great to be here. Thanks. Now we have some public announcements, so have your pen and paper ready. One of our friends from Asian Pulse TV is in dire need of kidney donation. We all have two kidneys. And if you would like to consider donating your kidney, and if you are the right candidate for the donation, please call us and we will guide you to how to go about it. Our friend who is in need of kidney has worked in healthcare for the past 35 years until the retirement and has saved many lives. Now it is our duty and our responsibility to save her life. If you are from Fijian community and you have had a kidney transplant in the past, and now you want to become an ambassador for Kidney Transplant Foundation, this is your opportunity. You can contact us and we will forward your information for to Kidney Foundation. Call us at 604-537-5123. If, if you have missed our show, you can watch it again tomorrow night at 8.30 and again on Saturday at 5.30 p.m. on Shaw Cable. We have several shows every week and there are three different shows that I would like to highlight today. First is Fiji in Focus, which you can watch on Tuesday at 10 p.m., Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. and Sundays at 4 p.m. Kamila Singh show every Monday at 10 a.m. and again on Sundays at 5.30 p.m. Viti Vibes TV on Thursdays at 10 p.m. and again on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. All of our shows are also uploaded on our YouTube channel under Kamila Singh Show. So please watch, subscribe, like and share. That's how you will show your support. So today, before I go, I want to leave you with these thoughts. Your health is an investment. It's not an expense. So invest wisely. With that, I'm your host, Manbir Randhawa, signing off today, and I'll see you next week.